So hello, my name is Nabin and welcome to the last uh, Airhex TV episode 69th in 2019 and the very very first time from a different streaming platform I'm streaming from Vimeo, no more from Ustream and I will keep this way What I'm also thinking about to uh, shifting the starting to um, to start start a time of the show to 8 p.m. CET next year so uh, let's see how it goes I think it is easier to me and also probably better to you so if you have any feedback, just write a Twitter or uh, or uh, put it to the to the gist of the next show. So we have lots of topics, and uh, let's start with the very first one. And the very first one is uh, actually my own topic because uh, from time to time I'm writing predictions for uh, what I'm thinking about the next year. And uh, I actually never mentioned it again. So I started in 2017, 2018, and 2019. And I was actually curious what I wrote. And I reread them. And uh, now let's see what I wrote. So let's start with 2017 predictions. So I would like to look at that. And um, what I wrote, the first prediction is back to insourcing. So my observation was that uh, the companies that do too much outsourcing so that nothing gets left <laughs> anymore and um, and uh, that they, they are they are searching again for in-house knowledge in-house expertise and um, I think it happened somehow it's not like you know uh, the the ultimate uh, ultimate uh, trend to to uh, be uh, extremely um, in-house and uh, not working anymore with external external developers but um, for instance if you consider the you know the Boeing strat uh, thread how to call it uh, no strategy they try to outsource everything and got problems with quality of the airplanes for instance and uh, what I also observe is that uh, my clients also try you know to build up uh, in-house knowledge instead of rely on external people which is somehow reasonable for uh, for the for the core domain of course then uh, what I also wrote that uh, now the bashing on Java articles keep going, which I think was true in 2017 and 18, but I don't think is this is true anymore in 2019 or 20. But uh, still, it is very fashionable to dislike Java. Say, so, let's say I, I hate Java. I would like to do Python or JavaScript, whatever. Um, so I still uh, hear it from time to time. And um, so um, and uh, what I have to say, what happened this year. So I, I don't think it happened in 2017, but uh, w when I wrote it, it was in the January January of 2017. But I think what um, what uh, what already happens is uh, everyone is bashing on microservices, and um, this happens a lot right now. But I don't think it happened in 2017, so I was not you know, completely right with that. Um, then um, so a backlash against Fed wars, Uber jars. Um, I was wrong, I think. People still accept that they are big and they say, okay, we can we, we cannot do anything about that. But um what happened in my project, so everything shifted to complete to thin uh, thin wars and uh, or shifted. I never deployed a Fed wars. But what also happened is um we have uh, for instance Quarkus, which also has uh, like a skim jar or or thin jar approach. And um so um, monitoring, yeah, this is also see a lot data overflow exceptions. So recently, I saw like uh, Prometheus metrics were exposed exposed for every public method, and uh, the the dashboard would be actually interesting how it looks like. And um, so um, interesting that I started with that in 2017. So back then, I wrote that uh, I see, I, sh I expect uh, JavaScript frameworks to disappear. I don't think they disappeared, but uh, I get uh, more and more contracts or requests for clients who would like to get rid of uh, JavaScript frameworks because of uh, backward compatibility and um, what we do, we just deploy vanilla web components, but I don't think it's a general trend. It's just um, uh, one possibility. But um, yeah, and, um, and JavaScript development becomes more and more similar to Java. I was actually absolutely right with that. So uh, recently, I did a microservice workshop, and then towards the end, it was actually in a, in a, in a nice city of Romania called Brasov. And at the end, ten minutes, I offered them I, I hack something for you for with JavaScript. And the, the Java devs, hardcore Java developers, were actually uh, surprised how how similar uh, this was what I did to Java. 
And um, yeah, project become more pragmatic. I yeah, I absolutely see this. It's not like you need you know funky frameworks to uh, to um, and and actually we deploy less and less software. So I, sh I think run less software becomes more fashionable. So the idea which uh, uh, made uh, Jakarta and micro 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 profile famous, I would say. Um, so. Um, I don't see a lot of problems with Chixo. No one even attempts to deploy Chixo to as as a microservice. So um, I thought it would be uh, no um over I would see a lot of over engineered Chixo applications or um these Java J JPMS Java platform modules, but I don't sort it a lot. Um, so um, and companies already recognize that Angular two is uh, more similar to React to um, Angular one, and uh, yeah, but uh, there are still Angular projects going. And but I would say globally, I think React is the most popular one. So um, React uh, is the clear winner. Um, in clouding, um, this is um, this is a mixed feeling. So some people uh, uh, are running. So most companies are running OpenShift as private cloud, and uh, or Kubernetes. I would say what I see is OpenShift and in a few cases uh, via um, Kubernetes, and um, and. Um, Public clouds are also relevant, but it's not like they completely took over. Um, okay, so uh, and Java e projects become more pragmatic. This is also absolutely what I, what I see. Um, recently, I performed some code reviews in enterprise project, and the recent projects were extremely well written. Uh, it was not application boundary control entity structure um, um, packages are named after you know, domain logic. No more DAOs, DTOs, mappers. Okay, so this was 2007. Um, it's hard to tell, you know, how successful I was. But um, what surprises me, what I actually predicted back then, I'm doing right now. Actually, nothing changed a lot for me. Um, okay, so let's see the next one. And the next one is 2018. So thin wars become mainstream. So I, I don't know why I was so obsessed uh, with the main uh, <laughs> thin wars. They are just reasonable. And um, yeah, um, in in Jakarta and MicroProfile, they became mainstream. Even in the um, EclipseCon uh, live stream, or not EclipseCon live stream, Jakarta live stream, uh, there were speakers I saw the very first time, and they mentioned Thin Wars already, which really surprised me. Um, and microservices become just another solution for a problem. Yeah, um, absolutely. Serverless overuse. Um, absolutely. This is what I saw. Everything had to be uh, serverless, and now no people back off because they 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 see that it's are far more complex than they originally thought. For me, it was actually clear that serverless uh, cannot be the you know solution for everything because uh, we tried this in Java for years, and uh, the problem was, of course, uh, the complexity. You know, if everything is a function, distributed functions, and a function call a function, at the end you don't need know who what is calling whom, and um, what uh, we did in um, in um, Java, we tried you know to keep everything more coarse grain and to be more maintainable. And I think this also happens in serverless where. You will use function as, uh, for instance, listeners to queues or uh, endpoints, and not just a gener general programming model. And also, if you do everything as serverless functions, it could become, you know, more expensive than just running uh, everything uh, as a as a service. Open Liberty became could become the killer Java application server. I think it is at least uh, most of enterprises know Open Liberty already, and it is really fast and 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 and. and great application server um so postgres is gaining uh, traction absolutely so i see it more and more in projects and actually today i spend a lot of time with postgres um, um for my client and as preparation for the upcoming air hacks workshops in munich airport starting tomorrow so um what i will show you is uh, demonstrate how the Bizium with postgres and kafka is working together JMS revival. I don't see JMS a lot. It's like nothing changed to back then. So it's, um, it, sh it should be more popular, but it, it isn't. I still use uh, C from time to time that people try to misuse Kafka uh, as a JMS alternative. And uh, the, the funniest request I got is they wanted to have Kafka without persistence, which um, it just uh, as 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 uh, interesting as having you know JMS without messages. <laughs> so um, so. Um, I would like to see more GMS, particularly, for instance, with Artemis on, or ActiveMQ is really interesting to, or 
actually it, it became more uh, it became uh, more popular because I see a uh, lots of MQTT for instance in, in the wild and uh, some projects are using Hive MQ, others are using Active MQ, and um, you could use GMS as as an API. Yeah, uh, still my um, the uh, Java nine nine modules, and I, I, I don't see a lot of overuse. Probably lots of uh, uh, um, developers uh, had problems with um, with OGI a bit, so they don't like you know to repeat the the, the same with. Uh, Java 9, 9 modules. So, Fed clients are back. Um, this is also what I absolutely see. So, we use, um, we are building uh, PWAs, SPAs, with nothing but Service Worker Cache API and actually in, only in rare cases IndexedDB. And uh, this is like JavaFX and Swing, or Swing. And, and actually, uh, next year I will also help to migrate some uh, Java clients to uh, pure web. Server side rendering. Uh, I don't see the you know uh, the uh, race of Java server pages, but what I what I heard uh, from time to time, like the hybrids, is e-commerce solution get getting uh, uh, popular at least in Germany, and they're using GSPs, which is kind of interesting. But this is not what I meant. I um, I, I thought actually that GSP would be great, you know, to pre-render uh, JavaScript, for instance, and uh, I, I we will still probably do it uh, in some cases where we would like to inject different configuration it JSP would be, would be just perfect if because uh, we need the server any, any, anyway so we could just use it um, as a uh, uh, where a view Java uh, JavaScript uh, pages could be pre-rendered so race of web components when was it 2018 yeah absolutely uh, so now this year would was extreme whatever i did was web component based or commercial projects and um and um what i also predicted at vadin elements very popular web component framework it happened even more ui5 components came came out with uh with sap so uh, a lot happened and what's interesting the part 13 i actually did it all the time this year so we didn't even have uh, npm on the developer machines um, and and this is what i predicted with 13 is known as uh, micro front ends I would, I would categorize that so we don't have any npm builds anymore locally uh, we use um, if we have to in rare cases npm on jenkins but locally we don't have uh, we have just browser sync um, and JavaScript becomes, it is already very similar to Java. So um, this was the 2018 prediction. And the predictions, and the last one is from this year. And I have to think what I will write now next year. So interesting. Oracle moved to open source the entire JDK with tooling, Java Mission Control. Um, so, um, so we have lots of uh, Java supporting uh, companies. If the question is, is it good or bad? Uh, some clients are unsure. It was too too many choices, and um, and I think it was it, it, it was a good thing. Um, so some of my clients are running uh, from Azul system supported OpenJDK, and you can you can buy or use support from Amazon. And GraalVM is a big thing. So um, uh, actually, uh, uh, innovations like GraalVM this is probably the biggest innovation in Java in the recent years. And um, for instance, what I didn't didn't knew about it back then is how popular Quarkus will get and uh, they were probably one of my 2020 predictions that Quarkus gets uh, really big um, because um, it does this is a true evolution of Java it's like you know you have the same programming model but you can say 50 or even 90 percent of RAM if you have to and uh, it is nice uh, it's a nice um, it's a nice document well documented and a nice, nice um, developer experience. So again, serverless and functional as a service. Um, this is widely overused. So still, yeah. And now we see already some backlash. So I heard a little, little bit of conferences and in projects. Yeah, it was not as effective as w we thought. So um, Kotlin is still got lots of requests. Kotlin, so it's still you know p very popular language and um, and and but Flutter is gaining momentum. So uh, many developers uh, really like Flutter for the front end, but Fuchsia is um, it was released. So but uh, it's not as popular as um, I thought. So um, um, yeah, interesting. Uh, Thin Wars again. So I think I, I don't want to mention Thin Wars again because uh, in 2020 we just have them and it doesn't make any sense to have a Fed Wars 
and with uh, Quarkus we get uh, thin jars or skim jars. So, um, yeah. Micro deployments, of course. So this is uh, and and by the way, in 2019 and 18, whatever I did, it was mostly on uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift, and Thin Wars played really well because um, yeah, develop the deployment was faster and um, it was it fit well in the cloud native model. So um, micro profile is very popular actually. So um, so um, if I mention micro profile, everyone asks me and knows about micro profile, and people think you know. One, someone asked me, can we even do microservices without pro micro profile? Um, yeah, uh, I had to say yes, but uh, this, this was the perception. So, Jakarta is ga gaining momentum. Yeah, this is uh, true. So, and 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 uh, I would say this is a great job from the uh, Jakarta EE or Eclipse, uh, how to call it, uh, managers, marketing people. Uh, they they are everywhere on conferences. Uh, they uh, you know they organize conferences. They have swag. They um, do, they 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 do a great work. And and it seems like Jakarta is every everybody's darling. So everyone is a sp sponsor. Um, so everyone contributes to Jakarta. E, so it's um, interesting, interesting uh, development. Um, ah, exactly. So uh, in uh, I think in two thousand nineteen. I think it's just most people believe that uh, micro profile is av available on all application servers, and there are no more, almost no more esoteric runtimes. Like, for instance, uh, this uh, Thorntail from Whitefly is going to be replaced with um, with Quarkus and stuff like that. So, and um, private cloud offerings. So, uh, Amazon Outpost, uh, Google GKE on Anthos. So, I think um, there, there, there will be a more and more push to uh, or push. Some companies would prefer to run the uh, the uh, cloud in their own data center. So this could take off, but it, none none of my clients think so far use that. So I was wrong or not very. Uh, I, I would say so. The cloud providers are moving in this direction, but none of my clients uh, used a private uh, private cloud from from these providers. What they what they installed was OpenShift. So this is what happened, and. Um, yeah, web components, big deal. So meanwhile, I I, I performed lots of workshops for uh, even non-Java programmers about web components. A, a lot of interest in web standards, in web components, because uh, larger companies don't like to migrate back and forth because just of some framework changes. Um, so uh, Scala and Clojure, I think they became less popular. So uh, uh, Kotlin is gaining uh, momentum, but uh, Scala and Clojure is less popular. So the, the use of external frameworks, it was really less. Uh, so this is, uh, it, it is almost like, you know, vanilla Java E applications, what I see in production right now. And uh, Netflix stopped developing uh, Hystrix, which gave also some pushback. So people became more cautious. So back then, you know, two years ago, people just, you know, pulled dependencies from whenever they they, they, they could because uh, they wanted to be, I don't know, to have, um, um, I don't know, to, 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 to have uh, funky projects. And right now people think about, you know, you aren't going to need it. So if there is, um, you can be successful without any external dependencies. Uh, yeah, a big deal. Microsoft uses uh, Edge on Chromium and I already have an installation on my Mac, so I'm I am able to run to running uh, Edge on on Mac, which is uh, which is interesting. And Kubernetes is the facto standard, and op OpenShift is the most popular popular Kubernetes distribution, at least in my world. And I think this will continue in 2020. So uh, this was the first, uh, the very first um point the next one is um Kov kovica or kovica asked me i have seen you using visual studio code the last couple of videos could you please explain which extension do you use and why so uh it was actually interesting so i opened my extension tab in visual studio code and um i'm i'm just i was surprised how how much i have installed so let's go through this ASCII doc, um, yeah, just to have syntax highlighting of ASCII do doc, Asia account, I think I have worked with Asia Cloud and I just, you know, clicked on the extension and install it. I don't use it a lot. It's just um, no idea. Debugger for Chrome, um, I'm surprised it's actually extension, but uh, what, what I can do with that, it, it comes with pre-configuration for debugging, so I can 
uh, set breakpoints in Visual Studio Code and 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 debug uh, Chrome. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why when I install that debugger for Java. I don't think I'm use uh, ever use that. So it uh, either it it came. I was just curious because it comes from Microsoft. But um, yeah, I will probably delete it after after the show. Declarative Jenkins support from uh, uh, Jenkins. I use it a lot, especially on J Jenkins on uh, OpenShift. So I have nice uh, syntax highlighting. Um, Docker, um, don't use it a lot, but uh, syntax highlighting is nice. Uh, encode and decode. I think um, I install it to uh, um, to uh, text select. Yeah. To um to to convert the HTML uh, entities like you know dollar a a u m l to um, HTML tags, Git history I don't think I ever use that so I will d d delete that. HTML preview I use it a little bit so if I write I write my blog post with Visual Studio Code, and then I see um, sometimes uh, it's nice to have a preview. The Java decompiler I don't think I ever use that. Um, Java dependency viewer. I can remember I installed that probably came with different annotations from different um, plugins. Java extension pack and Java test runner. Um, I was surprised it comes from Microsoft. I thought it was the Red Hat uh, support for Java. So, but uh, the Java test runner is nice because uh, you can click on at test and you see that the test is running. So I use it a few times. Kubernetes, I used that for syntax highlighting, but I don't have a uh, for uh, any uh, connection set up with Kubernetes on OpenShift. Java, I use it for Java editing and compiling. Lit HTML, um, I think this is the syntax highlighting within the um, HTML tag in Lit HTML. Then I use it a lot, and. Um, the uh, macro macros. This is what I in really installed, and what it is is I can automate some things. Like for instance, I can use uh, shortcuts to navigate between folders. Um, Markdown theme kit. No idea why is there Maven for Java. Uh, I use it that so now um, I, I don't use it a lot, and this is a little bit annoying because we, what happens now? It uh, Visual Studio Code tries to build projects in background, which I don't really need, but uh, I, I'm not sure when I install that. This NPM support, no idea why it's there. Uh, I don't need it, probably. What I think is what happened is um, there. I clicked on package JSON and it just asked me to install the um, the um, plugins and uh, so it installed Quarkus. Yeah, uh, Quarkus, uh, this is what I installed Quarkus because uh, extension because uh, it is really nice and helpful. Uh, for instance, uh, the killer feature is you can have in the MicroProfile config uh, um, code completion and syntax highlighting of the Quarkus configuration. Run on save. I will do was attempt to automate something, but I think um, I will deinstall it after the show. Terraform. Yeah, I played with Terraform. And this comes with uh, syntax highlighting. It's really nice. Varnish, the same syntax highlighting for Varnish uh, uh, cache. Visual Studio IntelliCode, huh. um, no idea when I installed this Visual Studio Code. OData, this I played with OData and I was just curious to know how helpful is this. And YAML, of course, uh, we need YAML syntax highlighting uh, because without syntax highlighting you are completely lost with YAML. So this is all I have and 80% of the uh, plugins are going to be uh, deleted after the show. So, perfect. Uh, Robin Nestru asked me why not YouTube, um, the uh, why I'm not streaming via YouTube. And the answer is because uh, all my workshops are on Vimeo already. And I think Vimeo is a little bit nicer. So there is no ads. And um, yeah, and yeah, this is just this was. And uh, the, the story behind is um, Today, I try to connect via Ustream and uh, they say I have to convert my account uh, to something else and I ca couldn't stream anymore and I have the Vimeo account, so I just use Vimeo right now and will keep using Vimeo. And if you don't like Vimeo, I could switch to YouTube, but uh, right now, everything, all systems are operational, so it seems it works well. So, first question, the next one. Uh, in the following scenario, uh, M. Lemnian asked me, backend logic is secured by permission. 
And permission, I think, what is permission? It's probably a role or something like this. Permission are, ah, there's not more than this. Permissions are associated to groups' roles and users are associated to groups' roles. Yeah, this is uh, the users. So in, in, in Java E, this is role-based access control and this works like that, that uh, the principal, user becomes principal, principal uh, is, uh, um, and, and principal is inside, has, has roles, so. Um, yeah. And yeah. There are scheduled job that are forced to use the same ba uh, backend logic. Is there an is there a standard Java E way to running those job with principle? And with principle, I mean uh first, Java E doesn't know anything about permissions. So uh, Java E just operates with principles and roles. But uh, what you can do, the standard Java E way, there is an annotation called run as. And the run as it runs a piece of code as a role, and if the so because the, the whole Java e security is based on roles, not principles. So this is what you could do. And if this is not enough, you can get uh, Zotaria, and then you can do whatever you like. So Zotaria is the JSR. I hope three seven five or two seven five is the Java e eight security, and with that you can do whatever you can, <laughs> whatever you can whatever you like, so you are completely free. This would be the standard way. Victor Röder is this, uh, the um, Airhex alumni, and the funny story is the uh, Victor found somewhere in Frankfurt uh, in, uh, a, a butcher with the name Bean, and he thought that uh, this is one of my extended family from Frankfurt, which is not true, and he uh, brings me sometimes you know, sausages or, or some <laughs> food from from the bean butcher from Frankfurt. And um, yeah, and what he found is that my Java 7 archetype ignores uh, package renaming. And this is true, I didn't implement that. And the reason is because uh, I have just one package and I think the name is pink, so it, uh, and call me a hack. So you have to rename it anyway. And, um, but I will probably accept your pull request. So the funny story is um, I, I, for a company, I created an archetype which was a little bit more in, involved than this and what I did is I I renamed everything properly so you could say you know the, the name was then let's say not call me a hex rather than let's say uh, DE Adam Bean or something like this and then package names and so forth and it came with a, a sample application which managed addresses and I found this in production several times because developers thought I like you know the addresses address management is part of the microservice experience and should be put to production so um, I think it is a better, you know, that you will see that com ehex pink is a bad idea to put in production. They will you have you will have at least rename it this manually. But I see your point. Um yeah, I will probably accept your pull request or, or, or see at least what you did, Victor. And we can discuss it next week. I think you will attend the ehex. And on one other note, you Jakarta E note, um archetype is missing. Um I pushed it twice. So the first time it disappeared, so I did it again. So hopefully now it's already in the repository. Um, if not, it is on my GitHub ac uh, account, but I push it uh, twice to the uh, uh, Maven Central Nexus. Okay, Lemnian, the next one. So this is the second question. He has, um, so in my in my current project, I received a Swagger 2.0 YAML file from an external system. I created a REST client using IOSwagger code Maven, junk, Maven plugin. But now I have some question. How you can handle source code generation? So from my perspective, um, if you would like to generate code, this is like you know back then with in SOAP or in Corba world. Um, if you think about this, so if your external client changes, the, your YAML changes probably. If the YAML changes, uh, you will have to regenerate your client. So it would be better if the code would be generated by the external microservice, and you would just you know uh, pull the the jar because you are depending on the generated file anyway. Um, this is what I will probably do. I will create a a uh, a, a jar, an external project jar, which uh, just um, generates on demand all the classes. They are not checked in. It just pulls the YAML, generates the code, compiles the code, and then pushes the jar, let's say, to Nexus. And then you will pull the jar and just use the jar. Um, so I wouldn't do this in your project because, uh, I mean, why? You are you are depending on the YAML anyway. And um, I don't see, you know, the added value of generation because then you could use uh, remote procedure calls straight. So it, 
great to use, you know, uh, REST. Uh, and, and the AML um, has nothing to do with Jakarta in micro profile. In, uh, in, 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 in micro profile, you would rather rely on um, open API, it's called. Uh, there are different annotations. And um, yeah, this is how, how I would uh, uh, deal with that. And if, or uh, what you could also do, you could create your own intermediary, like a gateway service, which which talks to the external system, and it comes with the generated code. If you like, I don't know how complex it is. Um, okay, so I hope I answered the question. So regardless what you are doing, uh, you are completely depending on the code generator. So I would externalize that, generate the code somewhere, create a jar, you know, pull the jar, and and I'm golden. Do you know uh, any full flow OAuth implementation for Jakarta or Quarkus? Um, no, but what I use this, I, um, usually uh, you will have to authenticate with someone um, or, or someone, identity provider. And um, and we use Keycloak a lot and in one project, um, a Microsoft tool. And in, in the Keycloak case, you get a JavaScript client which knows about the flow or a servlet filter which knows about the flow. And it comes with a Go library called uh, not gateway but uh, key cloak uh, go gate gatekeeper and the gatekeeper library um, it, it it knows about the flow so uh, the idea is you could do you could uh, with the gatekeeper library you could um, or the gatekeeper um, library performs the flow and then you get your token. Uh, this is the replacement of the of the uh, filter or interceptor. Okay, and uh, there is also a uh, Mojeka plugin or module for Apache, which uh, server which also does that. So this is what what oh, what I did. Now the next one. Uh, general comments on Visual Studio Code for Java programming. So I do it from time to time, but I'm still missing some basic refactoring capabilities. And it consumes a lot of memory, which is funny. So if you start Visual Studio Code with the Java language server, it uh, consumes a half a gig of RAM. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you demonstrate the, the size of Jakarta e-servers or, or, um, or microprofile runtimes, uh, I, I, I launch uh, a start activity. And, and and then the largest chunk is consumed by Visual Studio Code. Okay, so now uh, Nifty Development uh, says uh, thank you for super interesting AHEX FM podcast. So thank you. And by the way, I forgot to mention that. But um, by the way, this AHEX FM is also going crazy, and uh, it is more and more popular. And the recent um, episode was about vanilla web components and micro frontends. Then we had uh, about migration from Spring Boot to Quarkus. Uh, this was about Vodafone in Greece. And uh, the cloud native starter was with uh, Niklas Heidelhoff. Uh, and, and by the way, um, I um, also created a pull request to simplify the Java code to make it more Jakartaistic. Um, yeah, so these were the recent episodes. And of course, with Mark Struberg. Um, <laughs> Actually, bashing uh, um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, microservice bashing session. Uh, so this was one of my predictions uh, of 2017. Okay, so now back to here. And um, so this is Visual Studio Code. Is um, I use it a um, a little bit. And now uh, AXFM, you saw that um, um, it's, it's going strong, and there are uh, several episodes in the in the pipeline. And now, uh, a more interesting question is, you know, um, two-phase commit with um, uh, database and MQ, ser MQ series, uh, JMS, and uh, how to deal with classic two-phase commit. And uh, the classic two-phase commit was always problematic. So therefore, what, what I would rather do, and this is actually what I will show next week at the AHEX, where is my AHEX? So this is the page. I think it was happen in the streaming architecture workshop. So what we will do, we will write to Postgres in a single transaction and Postgres will push the uh, event to Kafka in a single transaction. 
uh, reliably so there is no two-phase commit needed so something like this you can do or of course what you can do you can um, in a database to write, write to a database table and then read from the database table so i would try to avoid uh, two-phase commit in distributed environments because it was always a little bit painful by the way what i see forgot to mention that uh, we have already dates for the next uh, two web frameworks web frameworks web workshops uh, in 2020 the one is web components kickstarter it's like the because um, it was like web standards essentials, but what's turned out uh, that uh, at the end of the day, we created lots of web components. So it was somehow web component related with web standards. And uh, this is about how to build more serious apps. So if you will, this is like the bootstrap and this is like the effective. Okay, so I can close that. Okay, so now, and on that note, so I can close the next one, uh, the, uh, the Tech 11 company, like this is Jakarta in Microprof startup, uh, they pinged me and, and, and told me that uh, they got a lot of uh, uh, actually uh, requests from, from AirHacks listeners and uh, they, um, they, they hired some candidates. And now they are seeking for searching for, um, for people who are interested in building web applications with, without frameworks, just with web components, ES6 standards, web standards, whatever I told you in the in the recent episode, this uh, happens there. So um, this is uh, the uh, uh, core as insurance as a service. Um, so this is what um, what uh, if if you're interested, try to apply and Tech 11, and you get a job as a web component developer without frameworks. Okay, now the next one, next topic. I can also kill that. Is it possible? Um, I only have to reactivate the streaming. So, is it possible to uh, uh, is it possible using MicroProfile JWT for authentication, but fetch user groups roles from external web services instead of JSON web token groups claim for authorization? So, uh, it is possible. The problem is um, you will have to use uh, Jakarta Esoteria, so it's not uh, possible with MicroProfile um, out of the box. So it, it, can, it just cannot do that. Um, what they think about is to provide in, uh, in future releases uh, you know, more flexibility about which claims to the support, but right now it is not possible. Yeah, also, it, it won't be also possible in future releases because this is outside of JSON Web Token spec. But this is easily doable with Jakarta eSecurity. By the way, the whole JSON Web Token uh, authentication is, is uh, easily doable with Jakarta e as well. So is it possible to set up timeout for JAXRS endpoints globally? Globally? It is properly on the HTTP uh, uh, pool. It is application server specific. But um, what you can do per JAXRS uh, endpoint, uh, async... Uh, Async response, which is suspended, there is a method set timeout, so you can set the method, um, and uh, whether it uh, it will just you know, um, or it sets the actual timeout on HTTP um, is not clear, um, and you can use the timeout from from MicroProfile library, um, and uh, but when I do rest call to fetch data from other service. Um, what it says is establishing an HTTP connection and reading from its blocking operation has no effect. So what it means is um, it, it seems like uh, this, the thread is blocked and it just runs in the, in the background. Uh, this is my, my interpretation of that. So um, yeah, timeout is more like making, uh, it, it works with uh, interceptors. So it intercepts you know, the, entire, the, the entire method call. So it's a completely different uh, approach to uh, timeout on HTTP level. So uh, this one says um, what it does is it creates a web target. The client is cached and the web target is returned and it says that sometimes it took 10 seconds. Um, e execution took 200 milliseconds. Seems like the network problem or problem to use transport layer effectively by Jersey client. So um, the, um, the Jersey client you can actually cache the uh, the, the uh, clients and also the targets so you could actually uh, cache the target per url but uh, 200 milliseconds is a little bit high it should be way lower than this and the question is now how many connections you actually opened 
it could you could also hit you know the um, the uh, connection lumens from from your box. So usually at the AHEX we do some uh, performance tests, and I was able to handle I don't know several hundred collect connections per, with several thousand transactions per second. So um, it should work. So I'm surprised that it um, it some sometimes takes uh, ten seconds. But what is true is if you're uh, you have to be a little bit careful with the queue depth and with the number of threads because uh, sometimes this uh, service locks up if you know the queue queue is without any limits no back pressure you will uh, you will have more and more requests in the queue and in, in the end of the day it will take a long a long time so the latency gets higher and uh, it takes a long a long time un until you process all the all the uh, requests um so uh lemnian asked me uh how i think the question is how would you prevent cascading service calls service bc I, I wouldn't prevent that i would measure actually that so if the service a is too slow because of the cascading um i will escalate that with prometheus metrics or prometheus i will expose the performance with prometheus um better with distributing tracing so you will see how you know the request travels from a b and c and then we'll see you know if the performance is fine it's fine but if it isn't uh you will have to do something about that um i don't see you know um so um what happened in my projects is or happened it was never different so we, we didn't have a lot crazy amount of microservices i think at most about 10 reasonable microservices and anything else was like you know they created microservice because they could without any reasonable um use case and in this particular case i would say if you have too many microservices are they really justified from the from the domain perspective if they are uh, it's fine i would just you know monitor them if they are not i will just merge them this is what i will do who can I prevent, or how properly, can I prevent or detect that my microservice architecture evolves into SOA hell? Uh, fun fact. Um, so this is the question is what it means. I mean, if you mean code generation by that or ESB or whatever. My customer tries to create an REST API integration layer for all business applications. Oh, all business applications is too much. But uh, for some business applications, it could make sense. There's a pattern called... Um, Backend for frontend, and what it actually does, it tries to expose a more uh, or a nicer API for frontend. A GraphQL attempts to do that, and OData as well. So take a look on OData, for instance, or GraphQL, and this is um, like unified API for backend services um, to simplify the implementation of frontends. So um, in some cases, it could make absolute sense, but if the client just would like to do this. Um, the question is why this this is the interesting part so now there is some attempts to resolve the issue with uh with the client and uh the uh m martin bogaskov says uh, he has 200 threads and it used my bulkhead pattern with procopine library so thank you of using my library but you can it is actually um not deprecated but it i could deprecate that because uh, take a look at microprofile for tolerance. It uh, it is uh, similar functionality with uh, with only a view annotations and even without any external dependencies, and any external dependencies to my library, right? So, um, so here's C ha C bastam mentem. Ask me. What would be the best practice for this issue? I have several microservices projects, and each one requires some parts of others. Uh, example, the service of credits require the entities of the client service and so on. For that reason, my solution was to create a common project for each service, client commons, credits commons. When I need an entity or data structure from another, I use the common parts like Maven dependency. Is any other elegant solution for that? Yes, it is. So um, it could happen that you say, okay, the credits commons is like entities which they will never change because let's say credit is a standardized uh, set of entities from you know the credit industry and this you, we, it is as stable as JPA. Then I will put all your credit commons 
I would consider them as an extension from MicroProfile or Jakarta platform is like JPA. And then I will put the jars, try to ship them with uh, with the platform, not with your war. So um, in the case, let's say, of, uh, of Quarkus, I would try to create an extension. In the case of application servers, I would try to put, put them into, for instance, let's say, um, Payara lib or something like that. So this is what I will do. And uh, the problem is, of course, the question before you do this, how often client commons and credit commons uh, actually are changing. And uh, if they change, how many services you will have to redeploy and how to communicate the changes to all the microservice consumers. This is the most interesting part. Okay. Ah, so AXFM seems to be more and more popular. So thank you for this. And this I also enjoy a lot. So there's a you know, conversation with nice people. And uh, yeah. I'm building a hardware cluster. This is true. Uh, I didn't, I have, um, so what I built, I built the, um, the Intel, I bought the Intel nukes and, uh, and I switch and um, they are running. But um, and the next week at the air hacks, um, I will just use my notebook because it's good enough. And what I also did, I uh, shipped my newest server. I forgot to make some pictures. So I will share it in uh, probably in January, you know, it's like a, or vacation episode or something like this. And um, and this is nothing a lot to say. It's just fun. So I'm just buying parts and uh, try to, to to build, you know, as fast servers as possible. And the recent one is just crazy. So it just starts in, I think, in two seconds, everything. So, um, yeah. Um, so I, I will do it. No, right now we have lots of topics, but uh, one of the upcoming episodes, I will probably... Uh, show you my server and the cluster was like the so I have a true server which uh, for instance my block is running on and the cluster was like you know nice to have cluster for Kubernetes and OpenShift experiments which also runs but is not as critical as the server Robert asked me uh, hi question about microservices architecture and reporting so let's say we are you are doing software for the environmental ministry have following domain-oriented microservices. Co uh, companies, water, air, wastes, and forests. Yeah, this is actually a great structure. So this is uh, like packages are well named. And now now you need to do a report for a center company which does business in air and water. The report needs to be re exported to PDF or Excel. So um, for instance, what you can have is you can at the same level a report folder and you can access air and what uh, and water, and you can even have a PDF uh, folder because um, the report on PDF, from my perspective, is something which is um, user driven. It's not like we need PDF in to make the user happy, and we need reports to make the user happy. What I'm against is to have you know commons or DAOs because it's nothing to do with the software. So this is like we should minimize the amount of commons and DAOs and maximize the um, the amount of uh, use case driven packages. There's just the origin idea how you design that so uh, as i said um report or pdf or on the uh, root level so on this level where the points are you can put whatever you like because it will be common to all packages here so you can even have a report component here which comprises these packages and on the report level you can have pdf on report exports and um yeah where you put the logic for aggregating data from three microservices on the same level as the microservices. This is what I will do and just name it properly like reports. Or probably there are specific reports because if this specific reports has something to do with air and water, this could be like, uh, what is air and water? It's probably marine or something, right? So then I will call it marine reports. And where you have the components to export data to Excel or PDF, so you could have an exports folder here. So it's also domain specific. If they, there is a user story exports, I would put a package exports. Does each microservice have Apache POI for Excel and ITEX for PDF generation? This was actually very similar to the commons here. No, um, POI on Excel or ITEX, you can just extract and, or yeah, extract from your from your thin war and put to the platform, install on the application server on Quarkus. So now, Siete, Siete, Stanislav, Stanislav says, could you please comment on 
thoughts on Java don't expose entities in API? So um, I read it, and uh, my understanding is uh, the author of the thoughts on Java said it is bad to directly expose entities, uh, and um, because you will have uh, put lots of annotations on the entities, and this will be bad. What I mean while I'm doing is I'm using JSON B, so my entities are sometimes JSON B entities, so there are no annotation at all. I just rely on convention of a configuration, and they are exposed directly. So what means is, of course, if you change a name of the entity, you will change the JSON structure of the entity, the public view. And what happens then is, then it will break the system tests, and uh, yeah, you will have to fix it. So um, I so I don't believe in mapping as a remedy for for uh, brittle for brittle uh, interfaces because even if i would introduce data transfer objects um I, I could still you know change the data transfer object and the same happens so and um what i did a lot this year code reviews and was you know endless copies of entities to data transfer objects again and again and in this particular cases what happened was they just you know copy attribute per attribute without any transformation. And this is what I don't understand. Um, I would just start with entities, public attributes, JSON B annotations, and directly map them to the outside world. Oh, Skong says he likes my work, so thank you. Um, ah, uh, let's, um, the last time a little bit lazier with the uh, you know my blog and everything else because overloaded with uh, real work, but it's getting better um, end of year, hopefully, in two weeks. Um, do you know if it's possible to use MicroProfile config with data source annotation? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by data source annotation. So you can use data source definition in Java E, but this is outside of MicroProfile config. What you can absolutely do, you can uh, create a data. Uh, this is called data source uh, MicroProfile, not data source. Date JDBC data source um, yeah and uh, this is Tommy but uh, config source this is the name no data source you confuse me data source you can use config sources in uh, micro profile and uh, introduce your own config source which will pull the uh, with uh, priority of your choice will pull you know the data from uh, whenever you like so this is what works per default but this is not like you cannot use the data source annotations in micro profile because it's, it's part of Jakarta e. so if the server understands that you could in theory use that but uh, this would be outside of your application because you would have to install this extension of micro profile directly on application server on your runtime and this would run outside your application usually Okay. Working with Docker and Kubernetes, we have decided to use environment variables. Yeah, this is also what I do. And uh, the only difference is, so the environment and variables, if you have them, uh, if they change, the service is, getting to, is going to be restarted. If you are pulling the data from, from database, you can have a dynamic, you can, you can pull the data on the fly uh, of course, it could be slower because you're pulling the data again and again. Uh, do you have some experience how to protect open API endpoint generated by MicroProfile library to fetch open API files? Uh, this is um, application server specific and uh, you can protect that um, in... <laughs> you will have to, to read the um, application server documentation. But in case, for instance, of uh, Payara, you can um, you can uh, protect the Open API matrix with, uh, and uh, the same is true with Open Liberty. So this is not um, specification; it's rather implementation. I don't want to expose my API in production. Then, for instance, Kubernetes or uh, on OpenShift, um, for instance, the route will point directly to your REST and the open API uh, would, wouldn't be exposed at all. So you could only access the API inside a cluster. This would be the easiest possibility without uh, involving the application server. So thank you a lot.
So let's see what happens here on Twitter. So nothing happens. And uh, the... Uh, oh! Brett Tucker, old friend from USA. Uh, hi, Brett. And uh, tomorrow we have the AHEX with Christus Christmas market. So I will post probably some uh, some pictures for you on, on, on Twitter because uh, Brett uh, attended previous uh, AHEX. So thank you for watching. Uh, the very first time with uh, Vimeo, so the next time it will be a little bit professional and Vimeo comes also with chat and other things. So we'll try to integrate a little bit better. Um, thank you for watching. See you upcoming conferences. Uh, AirHax in uh, 2020. I hope I try to create one slot more. So we'll have a three, uh, three, three dates right now. This year I only was able to deliver two. But uh, then tomorrow, this week, just the largest room on AirHax or Airport Munich, probably three beamers again. So we'll have lots of fun and prepare your questions. See you tomorrow. Thank you and bye.